Good morning. It is Sunday, November 1st. It's All Saints Day. I'm sorry that we couldn't meet together in person. Um, as you know, at Avondale, uh, someone had COVID um, at the church, and I was notified as a close contact. And so I got tested, and I'll get tested again, um, and just taking all the precautions, quarantining at home, and uh, um, making sure that I don't come in contact with anybody. But I have no symptoms. I feel okay, but we're just doing the, the safest thing possible to keep everyone um, as safe as possible. Okay. Would you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7? I'm going to read from the NASB this morning, but you are welcome to, to use whatever version of the Bible that you have at home. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. We're going to call this a dream for the dead. It is All Saints Day. This is the day that we remember those in the faith who have gone on before us. And so this passage written by the Apostle John, who was the last to, uh, to die. He lived into old age, the last of the disciples or the apostles to die. He lived into old age. He was not killed by opposition. Um, and he, he wrote this, and, and it is a dream. It is a vision. It's fantastical. It's mystical. It's larger than life. Um, there are creatures and hybrid creatures and swirling images and um, he, he uses this imagery to describe things not necessarily to keep them hidden but rather to reveal them because they're things for which we have no other words or images to describe and it's important that we read the book of revelation as having happened as happening and as will happen in the future. It is the explanation. It is the, the inner, it's the inside information. Um, it's like inside baseball, insider baseball, to understanding with a theological lens, with theological glasses, what is taking place in our world, um, what has meaning and value, how to make sense of histories and empires, and individuals and people groups, and uh, what we see is informed by what we hear. So what, what we hear is our theological core beliefs, and what we see sometimes looks larger than that, and sometimes it clarifies what we hear. So here is John, and the setting is the throne room, the throne room of God. And he is seated, and the Lamb is there. Let's read together. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Um, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. So if you can imagine these four creatures that have multiple heads and eyes and, and features, and they're sort of swirling around, and maybe even in a gyroscope uh, kind of movement, these four creatures representing all of creation, the created world that God has made, possibly north, south, east, and west, and they're moving around the throne. There's lots of motion while God, his position is seated and everything else is moving according and and maybe the the 24 elders represent time time being ordered um, as God wants it um, 
when everything works right. Or maybe the 24 represents a perfect vision of humanity where we live in, the, in God's cosmos, in God's creation, and we're in our proper place where nothing is broken. Everyone excels. Everything is in its order. Um, everything is fixed. Everything works. And these uh, uh, people, the multitude, they are from everywhere. It's important to understand that the word nation also means ethnic groups. The nation and ethnic groups, it's the same thing. And so our gospel of Jesus Christ is one where the Jew Jesus is the Messiah for Israel, for the people of God. But by being the Messiah of Israel, the people of God, he takes his proper place as the Messiah for all peoples. Because it is the Messiah from the Jews, Jesus, that is the king and ruler and savior and liberator, and freedom fighter, one who looses bondages for all people groups. And our gospel is one that does not exclude. And so if you, or if you see exclusion of people um, who are of different color, or people who are a different ethnic group, or speak a different language, or who we, we put, or who some groups put down, that's not the gospel of Jesus. That's something else. And it would be anti-Jesus or anti-Christ to label and exclude other peoples of the world from the natural goods of the world and from access uh, to theological materials and, and to the fellowship of the church. That is not of the Lord. It's anti-Christ. And so our gospel includes all people groups, all colors, all races, although the Bible doesn't have a conception of race in the sense that we use it in a, legally today. That's the gospel of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah as Messiah for all the nations, as healer of all of our problems. And these people in their white robes, waving palm branches, um, palm branches being a sign of, of victory, they have made it. They have survived. There's only one other place in the New Testament where these palm branches are mentioned, and that is when they threw them onto the ground as Jesus entered Jerusalem on a, a white, um, on a donkey uh, foal, on a, on a colt. And they are worshiping and praising God for being the creator and deliverer of um, uh, from captivity. And here's what everyone was saying. Amen, or amen, truth, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You can see that they could just go on and on and on with, with accolades and, and expressions of multiple kinds. Verse 13, and one of the elders said to me, John, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they and from where have they come? And John sort of looks around and says, what are you, what are you talking about, man? What are we doing here? And he says to him, my Lord or sir, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. This concept of tribulation or ordeal Please, let's not fall back into um, maybe the fear or scare tactics that were used when we were children with various movies or books about the tribulation. He, he just means 
the difficulty that we are living in. The, after Jesus, um, his birth, his death, his resurrection, everything else is end times. That is the definition by the New Testament. That is the witness of the New Testament. We are not going into the end times. We are living in the end times. And we have been living in the end times for the last 2,000 years because there's nothing more to be accomplished except for Jesus to return. And so the tribulation is our lives, the ordeal that we are in, whether that be political or economic or social. There's injustice and there's cancer and there is racism and there is nationalism of all kinds um, that wreak havoc and, and do harm and even bring death to others. People, through policies, uh, kill others. Um, we have illnesses. And, and what, what the image here is, is that these folks have died and made it out of this ordeal or out of this life that we are suffering in. It doesn't mean that there can't be joys and beauty and surprise in this life. It just means that this life is filled with one danger, one trouble after another. This scene is a scene of trouble no more. And this is our dream for the dead. Being All Saints Day, would you take a moment to remember those who have died in Christ and gone before us? Those maybe who were family members or friends or people who discipled us? People who were faithful? Some churches have plaques with names on them of those who have died and gone ahead. Other churches um, maybe have bricks or, or, or stones in walkways and, and steps and walls with their names inscribed as uh, they build the foundation um, of, of the people of God. Would you just say their names out loud? I'll give you a moment. Just where you are, just say them. Say their names out loud and remember them. Notice that they washed their robes. It's not that their robes were washed for them, but rather they put in some activity in washing their own robes. They chose to wash their robes in the blood of Christ. They chose to have their only defense, the last word on their lives, to be the death and resurrection in this mysterious sense of life in blood. They chose to have that be their only hope. What is that? What, what is it that we can hope on in this world that will never let us down? They chose, they actively washed their robes, their clothes, in the mystery of Jesus' blood. And they were washed white. And this white is um, like, uh, more like the color of uh, sheep's wool or the color of snow, and it's just a sense uh, of purity. Um, no, no stains or, or anything mixed, mixed in. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. And this image of God um, they are around him, and they are worshiping him, and then he spreads this tent, and he creates the tabernacle over the worship of the people who were living, died, and are living. The person that I want to remember this morning um, is someone who discipled me through her cards and her letters 
and her conversation with me. Um, her name is Eula Schwartz. And Eula, um, she died um, quite a couple decades ago. But when I was a young man, a kid even, um, I mowed her yard. And she was one of my Sunday school teachers. And after I'd mow her yard, we'd talk on her porch. And the thing about Eula is that she was someone who understood that the multitude who worships God come from every nation and tribe and tongue, people, language. Eula was someone who was a seeker, someone who was open to the creativity of God. Um, she gave me permission to ask questions and seek answers from the Lord. Um, and and uh, that was a freedom that not, um, in my experience growing up, not a lot of the church folk I knew encouraged questions, encouraged inquiries of the Lord. And Eula was there as a bright spot. And so today on All Saints Day, I remember Eula who chose to have her only refrain be the, the mystical blood of Jesus. <laughs> and she sits there today at the throne. And here is the liberation that we are headed to. In verse 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. He's quoting Isaiah. For the lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to springs of the water of life. And God shall wipe every tear from their eyes. This is where we are headed, that we will pass through our ordeal, through our tribulation, and we will have scars from it. But those scars will be healed, and we will have a shepherd who is at the center of the universe, of the cosmos, where he should be, and people in their hearts will put him there, and we will want to be in our proper place, and to be taken care of, and to be nurtured by the, by the God of the world. And anything, cancer, injustice, the worst things you can can think of war, anything, uh, chemical warfare that caused trial and dismay and hurt and pain and dysfunction in our lives, all of that will be, will be the image that he can come up with, the only image he can come up with is that God himself with his very hands, his resurrected hands, the body that will n never corrupt or never decay, will wipe those tears out of our eyes himself. Not the angels, not the creatures, not the elders, but God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So I see you, Eula. I see you with all of your tears, and I know what they are. I know what they were wiped away. And we affirm that they are waiting on us and we will go to them. And that is the dream for the dead. I pray that this gospel message impacts you in a way that activates your life, activates your mind and your heart, forms you in a way that is like Jesus. And to become like Jesus is to become our best selves that he intended us to be. God's peace to you. See you later.